recording in progress. Okay, so just briefly, once again, uh, thank you all for joining us. This is the Intermediate to Advanced Judges Workshop before WSDC 2022. Uh, at any point in time, feel free to stop Daniel and myself and ask a question. Uh, the purpose of this is for you to judges to grow, but also for us to have an in-depth discussion as to the rules, but also as to the way in which we do things to learn from each other. Uh, a brief overview as to what we will be talking about. So firstly, on evaluating third speeches and primarily here on evaluating the new content within the third speeches, as this is often a relatively contentious issue within world schools debating. Secondly, on evaluating replies, but also on giving specific feedback to replies to help individual speakers grow within their speeches. Thirdly, on resolving contradiction. And fourthly, on the judge process of judging at WSDC 2022. So primarily within that, uh, on the conferral judging process, how to provide OAs within that process, but also how to manage the discussions as a chair judge. So moving on to the first part of this workshop, evaluating third speeches. Uh, given that most of you are intermediate and, or all of you are intermediate and advanced judges, I assume that all of you are aware of the team and speaker roles. And within the third speeches, the crucial thing to mention is that one, they can still provide substantive arguments if they're flagged. And secondly, more importantly, their primary role is to provide rebuttal to the opposition case. And usually the speakers do this partly through summating what happened within the debate and through that also providing additional rebuttal and additional analysis within the entire debate. So here, um, just as general new, I think it skipped over a line. Oh, yeah. Uh, here, just as a general rule regard, regarding newness in third speeches, it is that newness is generally permissible within the third speeches. Moreover, it is something that is beneficial if these speakers add new analysis and add new uh, either examples or evidence within their arguments to substantiate their claims and to strengthen their overall case within the round. However, this is not permissible if they introduce an entirely independent and new concept within the debate that didn't exist earlier without it being flagged. So what do we mean by this and why the idea of an independent and entirely new concept is crucial for you as judges while evaluating uh, whether or not is something that is acceptable. So given that speakers in the third proposition and the opposition speech are required to also provide rebuttal, the content that they try to rebut and the analysis they use during the rebuttal will likely not be new as this is something which is used as a response to an existing concept within the round. However, on the flip side, if these speeches introduce a completely new concept, a new harm or a new benefit arising from this analysis, which is not included in the previous speeches from, for example, the opposition, this concept is something that the, op that the opposing team cannot foresee, meaning within the round of the debate, it is not possible for this team to respond to this analysis. Therefore, if the opposition third speaker introduces completely new ideas and completely new analysis within the round, basically it is impossible for the proposition team in any way to respond to this. Therefore, crediting this analysis would essentially be unfair to them as they have zero to almost none opportunity to recognize this. On the flip side, if this has been clearly flagged by the first speaker, then introducing new concepts or even fully new arguments is acceptable within especially the proposition third speech. So as a clear example of this, which can also be seen uh, here within uh, the info slide, if you have the motion of this house prefers leaderless social justice movements, it is not permissible for the third opposition speech for the first time in the debate to introduce a new argument which explains how it is easier to achieve legislative change due to an easier bargaining process with the government without responding to an argument from the proposition. The primary reason for this, uh, just one moment, I think there might be an issue with the video. Uh, the primary reason for this is this is a substantial new benefit in a mechanism which cannot be seen by the opposing team. It is neither it is rebutting or engaging with the prior existing content within the debate. However, if the third speaker 
introduces a rebuttal in explaining that charismatic re leaders are crucial in any aspect, then this analysis would be acceptable. So just very briefly before we move on, are there potentially any questions regarding this? Okay, I will just assume here not. Uh, one just very brief notion is that regardless if uh, the first and the second opposition speaker engage with a concept or engage with an argument, it is possible for the third opposition speaker to deliver a very strong rebuttal and ideally even win the entire clash or win the debate. Uh, so just because a concept is new within the round and if it's rebuttal, this does not mean that this rebuttal should immediately be disregarded and that this new rebuttal can be credited. However, this new rebuttal, once again, needs to be in a certain way integrated with the strategy of the team, and it also cannot be fully new and fully independent. Meaning, if there are implicit responses or different analyses provided by the opposition within the first two speeches, which are then used by the third speaker, this new analysis would be completely acceptable. Uh, however, this would still be poor strategy from the team overall, and the judges would need to critically evaluate whether or not the teams engage with each other strategically, and then evaluate whether, in terms of all of the categories in WSDC, this engagement is enough to win over that specific clash and to win over the debate as well. Um, so if there are no questions here, I will just move on to the next slide. Which, once again, talks about a very similar issue. However, one crucial thing here is that the third speeches in WSDC are not the same as web speeches in BP, uh, meaning there is more leeway from the third speeches in world schools. There is an expectation of them to add even more analysis. And specifically, if any of the judges come from formats such as Karl Popper, uh, these speakers are required essentially to introduce this and simply summarizing the debate is not something which is their role. So their primary role is to respond and to be responsive to the other team. And lastly, even if a concept is fully new, this does not necessarily mean you discredit it fully. It simply changes the way in which you credit it within the round as it is poor poorly done strategically, but also within the round, it is less possible for the other team to respond to this new con. Okay, uh, Daniel, potentially, if you have something to add as well. I think so far, so good. Unless any judges want to ask questions. Okay, then just a few brief, uh, frequently asked questions that appear. One is what happens to the overall division of, and how do you adjudicate new content if the third proposition speaker adds significant new content within the debate? So for an example, if the third proposition speaker announces an argument or even creates an additional argument, the question that often arises is, what do you credit and how do you credit the responses and the completely new analysis that come out of the third opposition? So if anyone would like to offer a response, feel free to do so. If not, uh, I will talk about it in a moment. Okay, so the overall rule of thumb here is, is that if the third proposition speaker adds significant new content within the round, which is acceptable for you as judges, then you also should provide similar leeway to the opposition in responding to it simply to allow the debate to happen, but also to allow the opposition third speaker to be responsive. Because note the previous slide and the slides in the judge and the debater briefing, the role of the third opposition speaker is to be responsive to the debate overall. Therefore, if they were responding to the analysis coming out of the third proposition speaker, this is likely something that you as a judge should and potentially uh, should credit, but also should reward within the round as this would likely be rebuttal, that is done primarily in the response to that team. However, once again, this does not allow the third opposition speakers to introduce fully new and autonomous con concept. So simply because a third opposition speak proposition speaker adds a new argument or adds new analysis, this does not mean that the third opposition speaker can now add a completely different argument, which does not engage with the case coming out of the proposition team. Secondly, 
what happens to the content that is new, however, still admissible in third clashes. Here, you do not necessarily always fully discredit content that is new within a third speech. However, you still weigh it differently, meaning a very strong response that is very new, but comes out in the third opposition speech should not be weighed fully the same as an equally strong response with equal analysis coming in the first opposition speech. The primary reason for this is that strategically doing such a strong response so late within the round makes this overall less important, but also does not allow the other team to respond to that argument. Lastly, uh, one question that is often asked, I don't feel that this is crucial for intermediate and advanced judges, but third speakers can structure their speech in any way, shape, or form, meaning it is perfectly acceptable for them to go through 10 or 15 different individual points during their speech, and this does not necessarily mean that you will penalize them as a speaker. Regardless, given that they're one of the last constructive speeches within the round, structure is often crucial for third speakers, meaning it is important for you as a judge to understand how individual points fit into the wider picture of the debate and how individual clashes win or lose the team the debate that happens. Therefore, it is often advisable to structure it into clash points or questions, if that makes the speech overall more persuasive and understandable for you as a judge. However, if a speaker manages to not structure it in that way and still be understandable, structured, and easy to follow, they should not be penalized for doing so. You as a judge should evaluate whether or not the structure of their speech made it easier for you to understand what is happening and to whether or not it made the team stronger or weaker within the round. With that in mind, any additional questions regarding third speeches? speeches? Okay, then I think we can move on to, oh, I actually think we had something got mixed up on the PowerPoint. Uh, fortunately, this does not create an issue for us because I feel that we have covered uh, the crucial part uh, that relates to the third speakers. Moving on to the reply speeches. And this is something that usually, at least from my exper previous experience as a coach, is that speakers often feel that reply speeches are not as important or feel that they often also receive less feedback from judges and receive less detailed feedback regarding reply speeches, which often can lead to them feeling that reply speeches overall are less important. So especially for chair judges and when discussing this with other judges regarding feedback or regarding the round uh, later on. So this is after the conferral discussion, when you're talking about what to say to the debaters, uh, it is also very beneficial to think about the reply speeches, to explain to speakers what they did well within them, but also what the role of the reply speech was in winning the debate and what potentially they could have done better. Uh, briefly here, the main point of the reply speech is to provide a summation of the debate that is often very biased. Uh, and through doing so, these speakers can prioritize different clashes within the round to showcase to the judges that different issues are important. This does not necessarily mean that they provide new analysis, which they're not allowed to do. So they cannot introduce any new content, uh, which introduces new arguments or new concepts within the round. The only thing they're allowed to do is potentially to raise new examples that illustrate the arguments that were already made within the round. And in doing so, by providing new examples and new characterizations of the arguments that are made, they can prioritize and should ideally prioritize different issues within the round to contribute to their team's overall persuasiveness. Meaning, ideally, a reply speech should prioritize the clashes that the team is currently winning and trying to mitigate the clashes that the team is losing. This is only one of the things that a reply speech can do. However, what they cannot do is add new analysis to attempt to win the clashes and the points which have already been raised within the round, as these observations absolutely need to be derivative of what happened within the round. Daniel, potentially something to add uh, here. Yep, uh, I think uh, it is time to reconfirm whether the judges have any questions, because I think so far the judges have been quite quiet. So I think it would be best if 
we can be more active in discussing because this is a workshop. Uh, I do have a question considering reply speeches. Should they be penalized if they do not react to new content that was brought up in opposition third speeches, specifically proposition replies? Uh, so I assume that you're talking about something that we also often call as an op block. So it is not the duty of the reply speakers to react to this, as it is the judges that primarily should penalize the team that is introducing new content or the specific speaker, as this new content cannot be admissible. However, if they point this out simply to you as a judge, this does not necessarily change their points in any way, shape, or form. If this is useful for you within the round, and if they explain to you why the content that exists, for example, an argument out of the proposition, how it rebuts new analysis out of the opposition third speaker, then this likely adds to their persuasiveness because they manage to sum up the debate in order to convince you even stronger that they win the round overall. So by simply pointing it out, they neither win or lose on their speaker points. But if they manage to show why their content already responds to this, simply by pointing the judge toward that content, this is something that likely leads to them being more persuasive and to them having more speaker points as well. Yeah. Uh, OK, if there are no questions, a few just very brief observations as to how to evaluate, but also then uh, how to generally provide feedback for your replies. So when you evaluate reply speeches, what you want to do is evaluate them on the basis of what they provide during their summation. So think of what has the reply speech done to me as a judge? Which of the arguments, and which of the clashes have I prioritized and seen within the round? And whether or not they were convincing in doing so. For example, if the reply speech led me to believe even stronger that one of the teams is winning, likely this reply speech was stronger overall because they managed to sum up a debate in a way that is convincing for me that they are winning it currently. This also ties into the crucial feedback uh, that I feel that reply speeches often miss out on is that uh, given that they're very personal, it's often very difficult to provide specific feedback as to how to improve. Therefore, it is likely useful to talk to individual reply speakers and offer them goals, which that they can see whether or not they fulfill. For an example, say to them what the perfect reply speech in your mind would be, and then different mechanisms as to how they could achieve this. For example, what I usually say is that a perfect reply speech is one that is currently losing a debate, however, manages to convince me as a judge to spend additional five or 10 minutes looking at the round and trying to find a way for them to win. Likely, this is a reply speech that managed to sum up the debate in such a way that forces me as a judge to try and judge the round for them. This is a very convincing speech, and this is also a very strong speech. Secondly, also what is usually advisable for the speakers is to learn from the OAs, meaning try to point the speakers in the differences between their reply speeches and your OA and how they could be closer to what the crucial issues were, but also then how to convince you stronger. Uh, and here I would open it up to everyone to give you a chance to also say if you had any personal experience or any good ways in giving reply speech feedback or any hardships while giving reply speech feedback as well. Okay, I will assume that the judges are still a bit inactive here. Uh, so we can move on towards the contradictions. Uh, and I feel all of us have had contradictions in our debates. This is something that happens even to very experienced debaters, and this is nothing to scoff about. Uh, the crucial thing here is that a contradiction is never an auto loss. Uh, so here, specifically, when doing conferral discussions, which is going to be useful for all, all of you, try to be very critical in discussing which contradictions happened but also whether or not these contradictions were resolved within the round. Because contradiction, contradictions often arise when teams are being non-nuanced or less than perfectly clear. Therefore, clearing up different analyses and providing nuance to these analyses can often be very beneficial and teams should be rewarded for clearing up those contradictions. And here, uh, as a brief rule, 
if we have two claims that are equally substantiated, likely, then you will discredit the last one that was made. However, if you have an entire argument which is contradictory to a single statement that was made first, likely you should not discount the entire argument, but rather discount the last substantiated claim. So you as judges should see which of the lines the team is actually trying to put forward. So which line has the stronger analysis and is strategically being used within the round, and then use this as a primary source of analysis or argumentation and discount the second one, which is then likely substantiated less to a large extent. Um, so here, once again, I will assume that there are no questions regarding contradictions. Potentially, what would be the case if you have a contradiction between an, an argument and a rebuttal made by the same team? So would that, which of the two would you potentially discount? Most likely the rebuttal, since the argument is more likely to have like stronger substantive analysis and mechanization, right? Yeah. So most likely, yes. Uh, however, then you also need to view as to the what the overall analysis is. So potentially the one that is being used more within the round that the team is putting forward throughout their entire speeches, then you need to sub disregard the one uh, that happens to a lesser extent. Okay, and now to something that I believe that most of you are here for. So the judging process at WSDC. Uh, and within here, I assume that everyone knows the characteristics of a model judge. The things that I would ask all of you as intermediate and advanced judges, currently judging in multiple tournaments across uh, both the divisions, but also later on after WSDC, is one, that it's always important to maintain room decorum and to be available for feedback, but also to pay attention during the round. And here, one specific thing which we are asking all of the adjudicators during WSDC 2022, uh, it is to have your cameras on during the debate, if at all possible. The reason for this is, first, we're asking the same of the debaters. So therefore, it would only be fair to do the same. But also, it is not necessarily pleasant to speak into the black voidness of Zoom and to not be sure whether or not someone is paying attention to you. So the same way in which, which we ask adjudicators to pay attention during the rounds, but also to show interest during the rounds in order to be also respectful of the debaters and to provide a good and valued, good atmosphere within the tournament, we do ask all of the adjudicators to have, to have their cameras on. This makes it easier for the speakers overall, but likely leads to lesser stress and more comfort during their speeches. Since these are high schoolers, uh, we feel that this is something that is beneficial and something that chairs should attempt to enforce uh, if there are no connection issues. Okay, the judging process. Um, I do assume that most of you have already heard of conferral. So very briefly, there are multiple steps here. One is you give a chance to everyone to arrive at a preliminary verdict. So the chair should give the panelists at least one to two minutes, maximum of five minutes to arrive and decide who would win the debate. Secondly, you engage in a conferral discussion. Uh, then you fill in your ballots, which is done independently. And if necessary, you have a set amount of time, i.e. a maximum of five minutes to prepare your OA, which is done by the chair or a panelist from the majority uh, that decided the round. After that, the chair or the panelist deliver the OA to the teams. And lastly, you should make yourself available to provide feedback to all the teams. So for the first part, uh, we will assume that the majority of you are already quite worse than judging WSDC. Therefore, nothing changes within here. You decide the crucial issues. The one thing that is important uh, and that we as the CAP have identified as crucial is to mention to all of the judges as to what the point of this preliminary uh, verdict step is. And that is to identify the crucial issues within the round. Given that you do not necessarily have to fill in a ballot, a majority of your time and a majority of the time that the panelists use should be spent in identifying the crucial issues, but also specifically for the chair judges, 
in identifying the contentious issues of the debate. So trying to identify where splits could happen, where potential rule breaks, i.e. tensions within the round, squirreling the motion, or introducing new concepts, uh, new, entirely new concepts in third speeches happen, and therefore immediately flag this and be prepared to flag this at the beginning of the control discussion in order to enable the discussion to be as productive as possible overall. Here, uh, just a very brief activity for all of you, and then unfortunately you will be forced to discuss it with Daniel and myself. Uh, this would be a very brief let's say, a uh, very brief uh, flow of the first proposition and the first opposition speech to the motion, this house would ban alcohol. Uh, so I would just give you a moment to watch what was written down here and then try to find what the crucial contentious issues at this point in the debate would be and which of the issues then you would raise uh, to the panel as the chair judges. Okay, so assuming you had the chance to read through uh, the slide, uh, would anyone just like to point out what the crucial issues at the end of those two speeches would be and which the contentious, where is the most contention lies and who is ahead as well? Okay, potentially Nicolas Yeronia. Uh... Can I just have a response as to whether or not uh, I'm audible or if you had the chance to read through it? Yeah, I can go. So I think um, in this particular clash, uh, something I'd be curious about that I would ask panelists. Uh, with regard to the opposition stance, is if opposition's mechanism for their impacts is sufficiently clear for them to win the argument in comparison to proposition's mechanisms for their impacts, which um, appear to me to be more clear. There seems to be a more clear line between uh, how you get from point A to point B for proposition. So differently, I think that proposition spends more time demonstrating how the choice is, is legitimate or exactly by which avenues crime increases whereas I'm not entirely certain for opposition what the mechanism is to get to addiction becoming worse. So I'd probably ask first, first ask questions on the differing characteristics of these mechanisms to start with. Uh, second, I think I might ask about where uh, proposition potentially preempts reputation offered by opposition. For example, I think that proposition is preempting uh, material about the scope of these impacts and opposition decides to attack the impacts by saying they have limited scope, that this might be material that proposition is actively preempting. Um, the last question I might ask is between choice and crime, uh, whether or not either of these two arguments has been given implicit or explicit, or implicitly or explicitly more weight in the round, and whether or not opposition uh, has a different take based off of their kind of time prioritization. So thank you, uh, thank you, Nicholas. I think that would be the, mo the more crucial issues within the round. Uh, would anyone also like to add something? Or if everyone agrees with Nicholas, then I would move on further. So yes, here you would likely see as to which of the prioritization exists and then see whether or not the mechanization of those 
individual clashes would exist here. And this is the process which you can use for all arguments and all debates in a similar manner as well. Okay, moving on. So after you arrive at your initial call and you as a chair think of the questions you would like to ask, you enter the discussion. Uh, here, one of the crucial issues is to attempt to clarify any potential things that you're unsure within the round. And as a brief note, it is also perfectly acceptable to ask questions if you feel that you haven't heard or understood the other team. Meaning even if you as a chair judge feel that you need to have authority within the round, it is acceptable and even beneficial for you to ask the panel as a whole if there are certain issues which you either didn't hear because of connection issues briefly or couldn't follow the teams fully within the round. Uh, Secondly, you do want to clarify any rule-based questions, even if you yourself are clear of them, because it provides for a better discussion overall. Uh, during this discussion, recheck your notes and then make your final decision. Just again, as a brief note, uh, we do ask all chairs to mention to everyone that there is no harm in changing their decision, but also that the purpose of this discussion is not to convince anyone. Given that this is a new system and a lot of the judges, uh, we are not deluding ourselves, are unlikely to spend a lot of time uh, introducing themselves to the nuances of this and not necessarily reading in depth, uh, it is the duty of the chairs to ensure that the discussion functions to the utmost of its efficiency and therefore to reach the best possible uh, decision within that. Uh, so after this conferral discussion, uh, during the conferral discussion, two things to be mindful of. Try to be as specific as, as possible in the discussion, but also be open. This openness means that the language you use, the questions you ask, but also the way in which you run the discussion should not be done with the purpose of convincing judges. It is done with the purpose of gathering information, meaning asking open-ended questions whenever there are certain contentious issues and not necessarily simply stating this is what has happened within the round, but rather discussing it openly within the panel. And in the event of a very significant split that is unlikely to change, call for a vote. There is not a need to discuss it fully if you know that the individuals are not going to change their minds. Okay, so I think that Nicholas has already given the answers uh, to this as to the previous exercise in saying that when you ask questions and when you have a specific dilemma, you, one, ask whether or not the mechanisms of the teams have been proven and to what extent. And secondly, then you ask whether or not something has been prioritized. However, if you have a question as to how to weigh up different issues, what type of questions would you ask from the panel? So for an example that is given here, if you believe that drinking alcohol uh, has been proven to be non-legitimate, but you also think uh, that alcoholics will consume lower amounts of alcohol from the opposing team, how would you ask the panel as to which of the two would be more important and how they weigh them up? I feel a bit as a school teacher in having to ask people to speak, but to move the overall workshop along, basically you try to first identify whether or not the teams have analysis and ask the individual panelists whether or not that they can identify analyses which would weigh up those two issues explicitly. If this does not exist or the individual panelists cannot identify these issues, then you can further on ask whether or not implicitly or on the basis of the overall characterization within the round, they believe either one or the second argument or the part of the clash should be prioritized. But also it is perfectly acceptable for the panelists or one of the judges to ask the same question. So if you at any point during the tournament are a panelist, it is also perfectly acceptable for you to ask a question of the rest of the panel if you yourself are unsure of. 
because you then are seeking additional information and it is beneficial for everyone to clarify it as much as possible. Okay, and now I'll just hand it over to Daniel. Great, uh, I think we can go to the next slide. I think the important part of this slide is just to note on the different formats. So I think the most important thing to note is Number one, there's only one OA in the WSCC 2022 format. So it's different with AP where each judge has to provide an OA. And just note it that the importance of discussion in WSDC, especially with conferral judging is medium to high. So this is important to equip all judges with the same information, uh, increase it and change the minds of judges and the outcome of the debate. Uh, probably, which is different with AP format, when you cannot change the discussion of each judge to the discussion importance. It's not as important as WSCC conferral. And this is also the same thing we use in WSCC last year, which is quite similar with AP, where each judge submit an independent ballot, so you can't change each judge decision. So just noting that in 2022, which is this year, we're using conferral judging. So discussion is really important, not only to enhance information of the overall panel, but it's also to possibly change the mind of judges uh, before the ballot submission. Next. Great. Uh, after the deliberation, there are two likely outcomes. So you either reach a consensus decision or you can also split. But either way, the next step after the deliberation is to fill in ballots independently. So in WSCC format, there are mainly three categories of scoring. There's content, style, and strategy. So these are the criteria used to review the performance of each team and assess the score to each speaker. I think a really important thing to know about scoring is that speaker score are mathematical expression of your decision and then your view of the speaker quality and not the other way around. That being said, I think there are three things that, that you should note then. The first one is a team score have to reflect your verdict or your win and loss decision which also means that low point wins are not allowed. So if you have a team that wants to debate with a speaker score of 250, uh, that team who lost the debate has to have a score lower than 250. So it could be 249.5, it can be 249. Uh, the point is it has to be lower than a team who wants to debate. Uh, the second thing to note also is that if you write down your speaker score, uh, prior to making that decision. So you are tracking down the uh, prediction of the speaker score after each speaker finishes his speech, which is completely allowed since it gives you a broad idea on how each speaker is doing. But after the debate, when you are adding up the score and you think that the team who should lose the debate uh, has a better uh, and higher total speaker points, I think what you should do is to review the score that you awarded for each speaker and adapt it to your decision and not the other way around. So the point here is you need to prioritize coming up with a decision rather than a speaker score and totaling up it to reach a decision. So the decision first, and then you can review your speaker points to adapt to that decision and to reflect to the win and loss. Uh, the last thing to note is uh, since the scores are a mathematical expression also for your perception on the quality of the speaker, you can also award the highest speaker score to someone of the losing team. So if you think that opposition overall team case is losing to proposition, but the second opposition in particular was really sort of strategic, was really convincing style and also content, uh, that speaker can be the best speaker of that room, but opposition should have overall lower speaker score than proposition because in overall decision making, you are convinced that proposition won that debate. So I think that is the distinction that we need to note down. The next thing to note is the full range is zero until 100 for a constructive speech and zero to 50 for a applied speaker score, but this is restricted by the rules to 60 to 80. So in WSCC, uh, the speaker score uh, 
is usually 60 to 80 and also 30 to 40 for a ply speaker. But realistically speaking, I'm going to discuss this more on the scoring later. Uh, the most realistic speaker points are 64 to 76. So 60 until 63, even though it's technically within a range, it is really least likely that a speaker will score 60 to 63 in WSCC, the same way as 77 until 80 is also an outlier in WSD format. So the most realistic scoring is 64 until 76. Um, small thing to note, style has 40 points, a content has 40 points, and a strategy finally has 20 points. Uh, point of information, I'll talk about this more on the POI adjustment column, but just a brief note that uh, a POI adjustment column is a modifier up to minus two uh, until max plus two, but this cannot push the total score outside the 60 to 80 point range. So if you think uh, uh, like a speaker deserve an 80, which is really, really, really unrealistic, but if you think so, and you think the PUI was really good, you cannot add the two points to 80 and make it outside the range of the speaker points, even though it is not within the substantive speech style strategy content and is a separate PUI adjustment column, you still cannot make the overall speaker points outside the bracket of the overall speaker points that uh, the rule allowed, which is 60 to 80. Uh, average speech is 70, and I want to know that this is different with AP format or BP format, where the average speaker points is 75. So the average speech is 70 with 28 as the average for style and uh, content and 14 for the average of strategy. Next. So uh, I'd like to then discuss the breakdown of each category. The first one is on the content. So content deals with what is being presented. So uh, when you are analyzing content, what you need to take account is the quality of the team case. And it could be arguments, it could be rebuttal, it could be PY, or uh, for example, the mechanism that they provide, uh, whether it's sufficient to explain how the policy solves X problem that proposition raised a bit uh, earlier. Uh, it can assess the quality of the rebuttal, but our, that rebuttal is only at best mitigatory, it like a mechanism or not, and et cetera, whether it had a lot of missing link to prove an argumentation and a claim, whether there's under explained example on the likelihood of why it applies to the motion. So overall content deals with what is being presented. It could be a rebuttal, it could be POI, it can be substantive cases and et cetera. The point is it is the content of the speech. So you're scoring that based on that. So this is the range for content. So the average for content is 28. Uh, so 27.5 to 28. 0.5. This is when the arguments are mostly well explained with only with some logical gaps uh, and etc. I think uh, you can screenshot the range. Uh, I think we are going to share this to you also. But the point is the average of content is 28. Uh, and I just want to also note that the first and the last bracket is also quite unlikely since if you add it to the score, it will be like 77 to 80 or 60 to 64. So the most realistic is the middle three bracket. Uh, next. Uh, next we have style. Well, content deals with what is being presented. Uh, style deals with how the content and the strategic choices are presented. So when you are analyzing style, there are a lot of of things that you need to take into account. The first one is uh, you need to hold yourself accountable that you are not uh, discriminating team based on the accent. So in WSDC, uh, there are a lot of ESL and EFL team. And I just want to make it very, very clear that style is not accent familiarity. So what constitute a style can be uh, body language, can be eye contact, can be the pace of speech because it affects the clarity of the speaker, can be the volume and tonal variations, and also characterization and, and picture painting. So what this means is basically the illustration of this speaker, how heavy an impact uh, is being 
or uh, style with the speaker and how much it create an emotional effect to the point that we can picture the impact very clearly as the judge we can picture the world very clearly on, for example, proposition. Uh, but I just want to note and reiterate that it is not about accent and is also not about immutable characteristics. It's also not about the format of presenting a speech. So there are a lot of style that people can use. People can use sheet, people can type, people can use palm cards. The point is uh, whatever format that they're using, it doesn't usually affect the judgment of style. So style usually deals with what I said earlier, I can deal with body language, eye contact, the pace of the speech, the clarity of the speech, and also the picture painting characterization and illustration. Next. So uh, understanding the categories in more depth, specifically on style, because uh, style is a bit tricky in WSAC format and also a bit contentious. So what you can do while scoring style is the first one is you can make direct comparisons between individual speaker in the round, even though it is less likely that style becomes a tipping point of a decision, because then again, you are arriving at your decision first instead of uh, adding up the scores of each category. Uh, but what you can do is also make a direct comparison between individual speaker style in the round. And it's quite rare that all speakers in a given round would receive equal point of style. When you're scoring style, you can ask yourself, was this argument presented in an effective or persuasive way? Was it clear? Was it convincing? Was it effective? Was the characterization painting a real picture of the world? How heavy was the impact? Uh, how emotional uh, does it? Uh, uh, illustrate the impact of their team and et cetera. Uh, but also you can ask yourself whether this style of the speaker make it easier or harder to follow, whether they are talking too fast that you didn't have the time to understand and process the argument uh, and et cetera. But I want to note again that immutable speech characters, they are not style. So speakers should not be penalized for stuttering or for having not a better English than EPL speaker for having an accent of being an EFL or ESL speaker. Uh, style, uh, the aspect of this style are what I just said. And what is not style is clearly accent is not style, format of speech is not style, immutable speech characteristic is not style. I just want to remind judges to hold yourself accountable, especially when you're scoring style. Next. Uh, the last one is strategy. Uh, so strategy deals with why something was presented in that specific debate. So while you're analyzing strategy, so you're scoring several things. The first one is the prioritization of material across speaker. It can also be time allocation. It can be the structure of the speech, the consistency of the speech, and et cetera, and the choices that speaker make to inflate or deprioritize part of the case, which is uh, particularly relevant in the latest speaker uh, when they are highlighting the team case, whether they have been strategic of it or not, whether they're contradicting the, their previous speaker, whether they're dedicating a lot of time on rebuttal, uh, but it is only repetition, but they're spending too little time for their constructive argumentation as first opposition and et cetera. So all of which that relate to the strategic implication of an argument, whether the speaker chooses to impact the right argument or not, uh, they will all reflect in the strategy. So uh, while strategy can be viewed separately as one of the categories, it correlates highly with and influence good content heavily because you're, if you're being strategic with your argumentation, uh, you most probably will have good content. However, uh, it still is viewed separately because there are cases that you are good strategically, but you just don't have enough mechanisms to prove the claim. So you have slightly worse content, but a good strategy. But in most cases, if you are strategic on what you are going to present, it most likely also influence good content heavily. Until this point, before we go to POI adjustment column, uh, I just want to, uh, to ask whether any judges want to ask questions on style, strategy, and content.
yeah, uh, Daniel, I actually had a question. Um, so I, I think this was in a judge test, and I think I wrote quite a long response to this, but if let's say a speaker doesn't take POI, uh, we mark that under the strategy column, right? And not in the other columns, because presumably like not taking a POI is a strategy is an unstrategic choice and therefore it will be under strategy, right? Yep. Uh that's right. So when a speaker does not take POI, uh they can be uh, penalized in the strategy score because it also affects the strategy of whether they're taking engagement or not, whether they could have responded to a POI that could have been a rebuttal to their team case and etc. Uh, so it can be in the strategy uh, part. Uh, Luca, do you want to add to that? No, I think that we, I think we said everything. Great. Uh, I just want to reiterate again, because scoring is quite important for speakers because speakers at WSDC are competing for speaker awards as well. And they are not only competing for themselves, they are also competing for their nations. So make sure that you hold yourself into account uh, when you are scoring each speaker, make sure you give scores based on what the speaker deserves and et cetera. Great, uh, we can go next to POI adjustment column if there are no other questions. Uh, one, two, three. Okay, I'm assuming there are no other questions. Uh, thank you, Ben, for asking. Uh, next is POI adjustment column. Uh, so uh, in my tracking video, I've uh, emphasized that you should not only track the arguments and rebuttal and the substantive part of the speech, but you should also track the POI ask, how the speaker responded to the POI, whether uh, the speaker was giving a poor POI a strategic POI and et cetera. So the way you score that POI is on the POI adjustment column. So POI adjustment column is a separate uh, box aside from the style strategy on content, and it can be up to minus two points to plus two points. Uh, so you can reward speakers uh, who ask good POI in the uh, POI column uh, and et cetera. So if the speaker, uh, answer to the POI, either they answered it well or not. Everything that happens within that eight minute speech will be bumped within the three categories I talked earlier with style, content, and strategy. And therefore, the answer to POI will be factored into one of these three categories. The, so, uh, what you also need to know that POI adjustment column can only punish or reward speakers based on whether they already are below average or highly above average. So you cannot add two points, for example, when the speech is already excellent. So I, I talked earlier about how 77 to 80 was an outlier. So if you think the speaker was really good, that it deserved 76, uh, and they asked really good POI as well. Uh, so you cannot add two points to 76 because that is already a very, a highly above average speech, and 79 is quite really, really rare in WSEC format. The same thing with a speaker being quite bad in the speech, and you think they deserve 64, and they give quite bad QI, you cannot just deduce and subtract the score and make it, for example, from 64 to 62, because that's already a really average speech. So you also need to take into account that QI adjustment column can only punch for reward speaker based on whether they are already very below average or whether they are highly already very above average. Next is an overall marking range. So for constructive speeches, uh, we have an overall of 60 to 80. So 70 is the average. Uh, if it is a good speech, then it's 71 points until 73. Very good, 74 to 75. Uh, I think I'll explain it more in detail in the next slide. But for constructive speeches, it is 60 to 80 with 70 being average. For reply speaker, uh, it is 30 to 40 with 35 being the average. Next. Yep, the description. So I just want to reiterate again that the first two uh, brackets, uh, whether it's the below brackets of 60 to 63 and 77 to 80 are uh, really rare in WSDC. So if a speech was really bad, like to the extent that they only speak like for 30 seconds, 
then then you might consider giving them a 63. But if they do give a speech and some of the points made are relevant to the debate and they are made with some analysis, even though there are significant logical gaps, then you can give them 64 to 66. Uh, if the, most of the points are made relevant to the debate, they have uh, some explanation, but it still has a lot of analytical gaps. They have a lot of missing mechanism. It's mostly easy to follow, but some sections may be hard to understand, and it falls into the 67 until the 69 category. If the speech was neither good, but neither bad, it doesn't impress, but it also doesn't make you think that it's a bad speech, and that's an average speech, and that falls in the category of 70. Next. Uh, next is 71 to 72. If arguments are all relevant, they have sufficient explanation without major logical gaps, and mostly they have credible evidence. Uh, you can give them 71 to 72. Uh, they engage with the most important issues, and arguments are almost all relevant. They have sufficient explanation without major logical cap, and they can be a 73 to 76. Six. And the reason why 77 to 80 is quite rare, especially 80, it has to be one of the best debating speeches ever given in school competition. Uh, and I just want to note that historically, I don't think anyone has made 80. So if you want to be the first person to give an 80, you have to ask yourself again and again. Uh, so next is the marking range for the reply uh, speaker. So reply speaker was a half of substantive speech. So substantive speech was 60 to 80 and a reply speaker was 30 to 40 with 35 being the average. And this is the description is on the slide. If it is like the speaker identified a major point of clash between two teams was able to provide basic justification and that's an average speech. Uh, if they do have a almost perfect overview of the debate and uh, they are, quite good in the interaction and also the use evidence and etc then that is a 36 to 39 and if they're not identifying the point of clash but they just retold what happened to the round which is particularly bad for strategy because they are not adding any additional value to the round uh, then that is a 31 to 34 uh, I just want to also note that 30 and 40 are really rare for reply speech in WSDC. Next. So, yep, students at WSDC are competing for speaker awards. So just make sure that you are being as fair as possible and make sure that your scoring is also calibrated. So WSDC 2018 top 10 speaker range, the highest uh, of these four years, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, the highest was in 2018, which is 74.69. So that's the world's best speaker uh, a, a score range. So if you want to give like a score really high, you have to consider whether the speech can potentially be world best speaker speech or not. Uh, the next thing to know also, is the last year, the range of the top 10 best speaker was 72.67 until 73.17. So you have to readjust your view on the debate and also the scoring from the past year to make sure that both scoring is calibrated. Next. Okay, so just very so, briefly to jump in. Uh, uh, this does not mean that you cannot give a 76 or a 77 or potentially even a 78. The top speakers presumably had something in 2018 between 72 to 75, 76, but this means it is quite unlikely. Therefore, whenever you give a score above 74, think twice or three times as to whether or not this would be justified and try to be a bit more critical in the same way if you're giving a speaker points around 65, try to think of good things that the speaker did and reevaluate the choices that you have made. And during the debate, and uh, after the debate, during the conferral, it is also perfectly acceptable to comment on the speaker scores overall by saying either, 
this is a very above average round. This is a debate that should deserve high speaker points. And ideally, these are the good things that the speakers did. Just briefly in order to calibrate the round between different panelists. So while you cannot sp spend a lot of time on it, it is beneficial to spend around 30 seconds to a minute, ideally if you have them, just to briefly calibrate the round and that we have overall a clear understanding of what the speaker scores are. Yep, uh, thank you so much, Luca. Uh, that is completely right. You still can give a high score. It's just that you make sure that you are giving it fairly as opposed to just giving it for the sake of giving it. So if the speech is genuinely really good, then give it, but you need to consider first whether the speech deserves like 76, 77. Uh, obviously some speeches deserve 76, 77. I've ever given 76 uh, to a couple of speakers, but just make sure that the speech was that good, that it deserves 76. The next is oral adjudication preparation. So different with Asian parliamentary where each judge will have to deliver an OA. In WSCC, typically only one member of the panel will deliver an OA reflecting the opinion for all judges. And in those cases, it was delivered by the chair. But when there's a split, the chair may also request a member of the majority to deliver the OA. And you want to make sure that your OA also factor in the dissenting opinions in, their, in your OA. So you take note while your deliberation, the uh, opinions of your dissenting panel, and you want to make sure that you also discuss why uh, the particular judges thought that the other team won the round and etc. The point is you need to take note as well during the deliberation, what are the other judges considerations and you have to incorporate that in the OA as well. Next. Uh, yep, so the OA delivery. So it's typically only eight minutes. So when you're delivering the OA, you typically announce the decision first. You don't need to make it suspenseful. You don't need to torture the team. Just announce who wins first. Uh, you also want to keep the OA within eight minutes. And please do not reveal any speak points, even though some speaker asks you what are their speak points, please do not spill it to any speaker. And in these eight minutes of the OA, what you can do is to walk teams to the tracking of the debate and its interaction rather than just giving them the list of the arguments they made. Uh, so you are not only concluding what happened in the round, but you're also explaining the rationale of the call. You can talk about why are specific issues more important in context of that particular debate. Uh, uh, are these issues equally as important? Which team what specific issues and what the weighing mechanism that you use in your OA and why and etc. You also need to be comparative on each point of argumentation, each point of style or strategy, which one is more persuasive between both teams. You can also explain the strength and weakness and it has to usually be comparative. So you also need to be specific. So a lot of judges, uh, I think this is the weakness for a lot of newer judges which is they use a lot of generic phrases like you need more analysis, you need to be more persuasive. So you need to be really clear in what case that they need more analysis on, what does it look like and how that, how will a more analysis impact to the strength of the argumentation as a whole. So instead of just saying that, uh, there are a lot of assertions, you have to directly point out what are the assertions and how it cost them the analysis that could have been stronger, that there were more mechanisms in the claim and et cetera. So just make sure that in your OA, you're not using only journaling phrases that proposition one because proposition provided me with more analysis or position like on analysis, they only give me assertions on the argumentation. You need to be clear on what kind of analysis that team X is assertive on, what kind of analysis is team Y uh, provide mechanism that successfully prove the claim, et cetera. Um, also, uh, you need to choose your language carefully. Uh, this is a WCC format, so you're judging school kids who tend to be quite vulnerable 
especially WSCC is very high pressure. Uh, they train for a long time. So you want to make sure that you also choose your language carefully. So no offensive comments, do not make fun of the speaker, obviously. So you need to be respectful at all time. Uh, you need to be constructive and you offer suggestions instead of really harsh criticisms. Uh, doesn't mean that you can't criticize the speaker, just need to control how you criticize the speaker because also need to take into account that they are high school teams and high school speakers. Uh, next is constructive feedback for teams of speakers. So in this role, you're an educator uh, and not just an unbiased judge. So you provide suggestions on, for example, how would you have approached the missions and specific arguments or responses that you might have run. Uh, I just want to note that this can be useful, but it's not a necessity for you to provide argumentation. But what is important is that you suggest the team, for example, how to prioritize the material, uh, how to provide, uh, what did they do well, uh, what they can do better in the next round, and etc. You also need to adjust your feedback to the speaker. If you know that you're judging in office, uh, please uh, avoid using really complex language. Uh, or complex comments, uh, you also don't want to single out speaker for doing poorly. For example, you know that PM, uh, uh, you know that OPWEB made the debate uh, to what proposition, swung the debate to prop, uh, and is specifically poor in opposition team. You don't want to make, uh, you don't want to mention this in your OA and feedback. Don't mention this because you're singling out OPWEB can be quite psychologically troubling for that particular speaker. So you can just provide the team with the feedback overall. Uh, even though you are giving individual feedback, you have to make sure that you're telling them what they do well and what they can improve on instead of saying that uh, you are the one who caused the team, your team the loss. It's because you didn't explain that your team lost and etc. So you want to make sure you don't do that. The next thing is next. So uh, this is the overview of the judging process again. So firstly, is you arrive at preliminary verdict, uh, then you engage in conferral, uh, you discuss, you deliberate, and you make final decision. So either you split or either you change your decision, you reach a consensus, you fill in ballots independently, so you prepare for the OA, you deliver the OA, and finally you deliver individual feedback. So this is the overview of WSCC judging. Uh, I wonder if there are any questions uh, from the judges. Okay, so I will assume there are no questions, then we can move on to the next part of the workshop. Uh, I will just stop recording until now, as this next part uh, deals with individual speeches, which we are not allowed to share with uh, all of the judges and all of the participants of the tournament.